Um, welcome to my talk about surface light cones sharing direct illumination for efficient multi-view rendering. So typically cloud rendering systems render images on an instance, instance basis and they do not usually share any computations between the instances and this causes sometimes uh, redundant computations. So if you, for example, think of team-based games or presentations or VR setups um, where cameras are all in the same location and looking at similar stuff, then this, of course, um, um, leads to uh, the idea of information sharing. So the question our research is, can we share the shading? Um, to determine that, we look at the rendering equation which is the basis for most realistic shading, and ask the question, what can be reduce, reused? So on the left is the uh, emission of the surface, um, which is, of course, view-dependent, but fast to evaluate, so we don't pay much attention to that. And the more computational expensive part is, of course, the gradient, uh, the, the integral, because it integrates over the whole hemisphere and in there is the BRDF which is of course view dependent which is multiplied by the illumination and the cosine. So the thing here we want to reuse is of course the illumination and when we look at when we look at it into more detail then we can split up the illumination into a direct part and an indirect part. Um, for the indirect illumination Many approaches exist um, due to the low directional variance. In this kind of data, you can use spherical harmonics or this kind of stuff. But for direct illumination, the data is very highly directional dependent, so it's not easy to express. And our question is if we can find a re representation to express this kind of data. So for this, we propose to use surface light cones which represent all incoming gradients on a certain surface point um, from all light sources, as you, for example, see here in the picture, where the, the radiance is represented, uh, the radiance from the street light is represented by those three cones. So in our representation, we have a multiple of cones. In practice, we use three. And then we have the cone count to know how many cones are active and an accumulation count to accumulate the, the radiance efficiently. Um, yeah. Each cone consists of a direction, an opening angle and the radiance um, it gathers. So now that we have defined this, um, this representation, the question is how do we implement it and how do we, for example, allocate the surface points, this kind of stuff. So for this, we use an implementation that's based on the paper effectless multi-viewer caching for cloud native rendering by Weindauch and Tatsken et al., which will be presented at this year's SIGGRAPH. They use a combination of world space caches and on-surface caches to reduce computations and share data between users for various different effects. So we use the on-surface caches, so a quick overview about that. So the first uh, visibility buffers are fed into the system. The visibility buffers of each user is fed into the system and the visibility stage determines which cache entries are active. Then some scheduling and processing is done and then the cache update stage um, updates the cache entries on on a effect basis. So we for example AO and hard shadow of CM. And after that on a after that the composition stage um, creates the final image by sampling the caches and yeah and shade and com and compositing the image. So what we add is the surface light cone update to the cache updating cache update stage where we retrieve the cones if they are already represented. Otherwise, one can, for example, fetch them from a different LOD or such, 
and then we integrate the new data into the cones and update the cones and then we store them again with retrieving and storing. I mean, the, the base system, so the cones are stored in a texture format because it's, it's given by the base system and so we have to do some bit magic and format conversion yeah, to fit it in. And after that, on a per fewer basis, we at the shading where we retrieve the cones and then sample the cones and create the shading and composite it to the other colors of the other effects. So for the update process, I have a very simple scene here. Um, um, yeah, for each surface cache entry, we random sample all scene light sources, so uh, emissive surfaces, environment maps, and uh, area light sources. So just an example here, we sample the scene light source and if it's not occluded, we add a cone and we continue like that. For uh, occluded scene light sources, of course, we dismiss the samples. And for samples that are not occluded and close to another cone, we merge it to the, the new cone, uh, to an existing cone. And we continue like that until we have our representation. So this is, of course, now only for for static scenarios, what if the, for example, this wall fade uh, disappears now? Um, the operations before can al also handle this by just sampling the new light source at the new unoccluded light source at some point and adding to to this cone. Um, but if this wall appears again, the operations before wouldn't suffice to adapt our representation to to fit the lighting situa situation. Therefore, we also sample the cones at, at the borders, some epsilon ep away from the borders, and if this sample doesn't hit a uh, light source, then we shrink the cones. We continue this a few times until we have the right representation again. Of course, usually dynamic changes happen slowly, and so we don't need that many samples to adapt the cones. In practice, this looks like that, where the light source moves from left to right. And in the center image, you see that the, the surface point becomes partially occluded, and this is where the cones split up into two. And after the light source continues moving, the cones merge again. And yeah. So I mentioned temporal accumulation quickly before. So we do this very simple, where we have the old value times factor plus the newly sampled value times the factor, and that's how we get our new radiance. But for and and this factor is based of the on the accumulation count. So the question is if we just can simply increase the in accumulation count, and this is not the case when dynamic changes happen, because newly added radiance wouldn't be that fast. The wouldn't be that quickly integrated into into our uh, representation, and that's a problem. Um, therefore, when a change happens in the scene, we reduce the accumulation count a bit by this formula, which worked well in practice. Um, and by reducing that, the newly changes are applied in a more quick manner. Um, yeah, this accumulation count is adapted based on the angle of change of the cone, and yeah, in practice that worked well. So, for the shading process, now that we have our cone representation, we can just simply sample a cone and then evaluate the BIDF for this cone, multiply it by the radiance of this cone divided by the number of samples and multiply with the cosine. And if we do this for <coughs> if we do this for all cones, then you kind of represent the integral of the shading equation, and if you continu can con continue to add the emission, then you have an approximation of the shading equation again. Of course, this is more accurate the more cones you add, because you better represent incoming data. So, for the evaluation, I want to firstly, uh, first quickly show you the, the single viewer data, and to establish effectiveness there, and then continue with the multi-viewer. Um, yeah, for evaluation, we have 
chosen three cones because overall this worked well in practice. And yep, you see um, Viking Village here as one of the test scenes, which we compared with the simple redressed uh, version with 16 samples and 48 samples. 60 samples because it overall compared very well to our timings and 48 samples because <coughs> it compared overall good to to our quality overall test scenes of course. You can see here that we outperform other other measurements, other other approaches like for example at RTXDI. And yeah. Let's look at some other scenes. Here you see San Miguel with an environment map and uh, the the lamps activated. And here's a version of Intel sponsor scene, which we adapted a bit and placed different lights. Um, we also have a bistro exterior scene with moving lights and moving gears to show dynamic changes. Here you see that we are a bit slower than RTXDI because we have to adapt to these faster dynamic changes. And there is the Viking village from before, where a, a large moon is placed and the, the torches are activated. So now that we establish effectiveness for the single viewer case, let's go to the multi viewer. Um, here's an example of the sponsor scene you just seen before with a camera overlap of 60%. And overall, if we don't, ev <coughs> if we don't start out with a better performance for one viewer, we, after adding some viewers, we achieve a better performance at some point, as you see here. Um, yeah, let's look at, oh yeah, so different overlaps uh, result in different timings, of course. So this is as you would uh, would you would expect. For an uh, overlap of 100, you have this um, yeah just a uh, uh, overlap of 100. You have this minimal overhead, which increases the timings a bit here. And this is also for the for the sponsor scene. So let's look at more natural example. Um, we have 16 uncorrelated paths through the sponsor scene which look like that. Yeah, so they move uncorrelated through the scene. First, they look all in the, in the, in the same direction and then, yeah, they move uncorrelated. Um, of course, for this is shown for our, our approach for 16 single viewers and now 16 stereo viewers. And this leads to the following results. So on the left, you can see the 16 single viewer version where we outperform the other methods. If we have eight stereo viewers, so still 16 views, but with a higher overlap because they're in a stereo pos position, then our, our timings go a bit down while the others approximately stay the same. When moving from 16 single viewers to 16 stereo viewers, we see that all other methods double the timings, uh, while ours doesn't. For RTX, there yeah, we couldn't run uh, an experiment here because it ran out of memory for this amount of views. So talking about memory, here you see a memory graph for the sponsor scene, where you can see that the redressed version doesn't use additional memory um, it th because it doesn't keep track of anything between frames. And you see that ours increases steadily while RTXDI um, always doubles in memory because it always needs to keep track of, of, of the screen space parameters and stuff. Um, yeah, and of the reservoirs. So what are our limitations? So of course, these three cone representation has a limit at some point. On the left, you see uh, the scene with a lower number of lights, on the right with a higher number of lights, and you can see that when we increase the number of lights, that in certain areas um, where there are too many dominant lights, 
the cones try to um, include a too large direction which which leads to noise, as you can see in the zoom in here. Of course, a solution to this would be to just increase the number of cones. Yes. So we also handle um, environment maps, but this of course is an edge case again, where the, the lights all spread out over the hemisphere, which causes again the cones to to be too large and then this causes um, noise again. Yeah, this also happens if you have too many small lights that all spread out and yeah. Of course you can increase the number of cones again to express this, but yeah. So to conclude, we've shown a cone representation for incoming radiance and integrated this into a pipeline and showed how that the reuse is efficient. Um, therefore, we outperform other methods for the multi-view case and also sometimes for the mostly for the single view case. Um, as shown before, um, this expression isn't always enough to express all light scenarios. For example, you have the surrounding lights, then for example, spherical harmonics would be better or you have just multiple small lights where you can, for example, use visibility caching and this would be faster, so simple shadow mapping and this kind of stuff, which would be faster. Um, a complete system would, of course, include those other methods and switch between them, and that's something for, for the future work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice presentation. Um, any questions from the audience? Thank you for the talk. Uh, I was wondering when you explain how, if a nuclear uh, um, appears, how you shrink uh, back the cone, what happens if the occluder appears in the middle? For example, if you only had like one straight line uh, to start with, and then the line maybe starts rotating and occludes more and more of the cone. Um, so you mean in the, sorry, I didn't get it fully. So if you have like a, a large cone like this, yeah. and then you have an occluder that was maybe like a thin line in the yeah. middle, but that starts rotating and blocking more and more of the cone. With your approach, or how do you describe it? It seems like you would trace samples on the sides, but those would still not be occluded to start with. Yeah, um, noise will probably appear in that case. Okay. And yeah, the radiance is still right, but you, you get some noise if in that case. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Then uh, I have one question. I saw some very nice uh, comparisons uh, against uh, RTX DI. Uh, I can imagine uh, that when you increase the number of light sources, uh, this uh, comparison becomes uh, less favorable at some point. Mm. Uh, at, at which number of light sources is that going to be, roughly? That's very dependent on, on the scene setup and the light setup and how dominant the lights are. So it's difficult to say if you have really um, dominant light sources that are really shining on, it on a specific point and then it's probably larger than the number of cones, but it, if, if they're not the dominant, then yeah, they would uh, last longer. So, yeah, so, so the technique strongly relies on having some very clear dominant light sources. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Pascal. Oh, there's one more question over there, uh, and I think we still have time for that. Um, there was a grid-based variant of free steer for direct illumination where the reservoirs exist in a clip map. Um, so I imagine that would also enable some reuse for different views. Have you considered that or compared to that? Mm, no, but I need to, <laughs> I will consider it now. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, thank you, Pascal. Thank you. And it takes